All right, well, we are going to continue our series on finding purpose. And uh, last week, last week we were in part 11 of finding purpose. And it was uh, the purpose of wealth, the purpose of wealth. And how do we best use the money that God has given to us? I mentioned uh, two words to you and two principles. The two words were contentment and covetousness. Uh, contentment is something that we ought to be in. Covetousness is something we ought to avoid. I also mentioned uh, two principles, and that is that God provides our needs through wealth, number one, and then God provides the needs of others through our wealth. That is how God does it. So two real quick things, two principles, two words and two principles, and this morning we're going to jump right into part 12, part 12, finding purpose for the family, finding purpose for the family. Now, as I kind of introduce this message, I, I, I want to let you know something. That at times we have, a, we have a tendency to kind of omit some of the things that are taught because we don't think they're, they're pertinent. We don't think they pertain to us individually. And I just want to ask you to do me just one favor this morning. Don't, don't plug your ears yet. There's, there may be some people in this very, very room who say, well, I don't really have a family, so to speak. Maybe not under, in, in, within your definition of a family. Maybe you don't have kids. This message is still for you. Maybe you don't have a spouse, but this message is, is still for you. Let me tell you, you might not have an immediate family sitting in this auditorium right now with you, but let me tell you what, you all have a family you are all somebody's kids. And you say, well, you know, my parents, my parents died already. They passed away. But you are, you are still somebody's child. And the Bible, the Bible is good for everyone. The Bible is good for everyone. As a matter of fact, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's all God breathed. God breathed out the Scripture. And it says this, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and in for, for instruction of righteousness. It, it goes on and says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So the scripture that you're going to hear this morning is good for you. It's good for you. I remember years ago, uh, I, I, had, um, I had somebody who said to me, they said, uh, Pastor, if you weren't married, I couldn't come to your church. And I said, so I don't get that. He said, well, if you weren't married. I said, you mean divorced? He says, no, no, I mean, if you, if you never got married, I couldn't come to your church. How can you lead a church? How can you be a pastor and tell other people how to have a good marriage, you not having a marriage of your own? And I, I, I just, it boggles my mind. Well, Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, wasn't married, and yet he speaks on the topic of marriage. See, the Bible is profitable. It's good for everyone. So please do me a favor. As we go through this message, don't just plug your ears. Listen to what God has to say about the family, the purpose for a family. All right, let's begin. First of all, we have to understand that the purpose of family has a context. It has a context. And the context is to be understood within, this, uh, within the realm of having a right relationship uh, with God. It's understood as a right relationship with God. First of all, let me say this, that uh, it's God that builds your home. It's God that builds your home. It's not you that builds your home. Psalm 127 says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Here's the reality. You can't effectively build your house, a godly house, without God. You need somebody, you need somebody in your life, like God, by the way, to help you to build a house of God the right way. So as you build your relationship within your family, understanding that it's in the context of a right relationship, you have to understand that it's God that builds your house. And if you try to build it, you're going to labor in vain. You need God's help. I was a general contractor for many years, and, and uh, I always stumbled on, on, on uh, homeowners who tried to, to try to do a job, a building job, by themselves. 
And uh, matter of fact, I had a friend of mine who put in a, a pool in his backyard. Now, mind you, this is no ordinary pool. It's about a $300,000 pool. I mean, it had this huge water slide coming off of a mountain. I mean, it was legit. I'm going to use that word. It was legit. I mean, I, look, I came in the back one day, and I was like, wow, now that's a pool. I said, how long did this take? Scott says to me, he was a VP at Morgan Stanley, and he says, uh, he says it took me way too long. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, we broke ground last August, and here it was August. A year later, he still hadn't done it. I mean, he still wasn't done. He says, I spend so much time and money building something that I had no business doing. I had no business generally in this. He says to me, he says, I should have had you do it. You see, when it comes to a home that's built with a right relationship with God, except the Lord build it, they labor in vain that build it. You can't build a right relationship with God without God. You need Him. You need His help. And friends, if you're not aiming at a right relationship with God, you're not aiming at the right target. God has got to be the center of your home. He has to be the center of your home. We call it a home that's, that is uh, theocentric. That's just a, a fancy word, meaning that it's God at the center. You have God, Theo, and it's centric, at the center. So God is here, and you, you orb, everything you do orbits around God and Him. And if you don't have that in your home, you're going to miss it. And you'll end up laboring in vain. The original family was centered around a right relationship with God, the original family. Think of Adam and Eve. We go back to the garden. Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. See, I knew fishing was biblical. <laughs> and over the fowl of the air, once again, bird hunters, and over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his image, and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now listen to this. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now let me tell you something about this relationship with God. That it was a relationship with God. It's centered around walking and talking with God. Let me go on a little further. We get a little bit more descriptive when we get into Genesis chapter 2, and we see verse 18. And the Lord said, Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. Now, I, the women love that verse, by the way. Uh, I would, listen, I will make him and help me for. Him. So God says, it's not good that man should be by himself, but you're going to need a woman in your life. <laughs> so guess what? God created this woman. And in verse 21 to 24, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made a woman and brought her unto him. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. The first family, the first family had a di direct, had a, had a fellowshipping, intimate relationship with God. And friends, if we don't have a relationship with God, we're going to labor in vain as we build our house. And that's a problem. Because we're going to come on the scene and we're going to just, we're going to really mess this thing up. As many of us do so well as we try to build things that we shouldn't be building. All of the activity was in the context of a personal relationship with God. If we don't have that, we're going we're gonna to miss this. And by the way, this is normal. This is what a normal relationship should be a normal family. A normal family should have a relationship with God all the time. You see, I talk to families and they, they don't have a right relationship with God. They don't have a, a, normal, a normal relationship with God. And they look at me and they say, well, that's abnormal to, to have, a, have, a, have, a, have, a, 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 have a family that goes to church all the time and, 
and they talk about the things of God. They say that that's abnormal. And I say, no, no, that is normal. What you have is not normal. We were created for this type of fellowship. And by the way, when, when, when we got involved with our way, with our sin, that's when it got all messed up. So we have to allow God to build the house. Now, having said that, that God builds the house, second of all, that we are co-laborers in the building process. We are co-laborers in the building process. And with regards to our children, we have a responsibility to train them. We have a responsibility to train our children. Among other scripture passages, Deuteronomy 6 reminds us as parents that we are called as parents to impress on the hearts of our children a right relationship with God. If we are not doing that, we are not co-laboring co -laboring with Christ in building the home. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 through 7, it says this, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Now, granted, this was addressed to, to Israel, okay, to the nation of Israel. But I think that this, that this applies to us today. Can I say that? Can I say that I believe that this applies to us today? Listen to this. He says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. I believe this applies to us today. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. I think this applies to us today. If we are not discussing how to have a right relationship with God, we are going to miss it. And we are not going to be co-laborers. We are going to say, you know, you've heard the old adage, just let go and let God, right? He, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. But what I want you to do is I want you to come aside alongside of me, the Lord, and I want you to help me labor in this process. We have a responsibility to train our children. And by the way, friends, if you don't train your children, someone else will. And I promise you this, they're not going to train. The world is not going to train your children how to be good Christians. That's not what they're going to do. They are going to teach them how to be worldly. It's our responsibility as parents how to teach them to be Christians. They're not going to lead your kids to Christ. They're not going to bring them to church. And so many parents fail thinking that the world is just going to be, they're just going to, they're going to help. Friends, they're not helping in the process. They're not helping in the process. One guy says, good children don't emerge by accident. They are the fruit of careful cultivation. Good children take a lot of work. It's not something that just happens by accident. Now, let me tell you this. Children have a free will, though. You understand that? Even all of the right cultivation, even a parent that does everything right for their children, they still have a choice to make, don't they? Salvation is a choice, and service is a choice. They still have a choice. But we can be co-laborers with God, making that choice easier to make. Now let me just give you a, a word of application here is uh, is nobody is perfect in training their children we all have room to move we all have room to grow there's not one person in this room I certainly am not perfect should I pray with my children more yeah it, would I would I, I'd be lying to you if I said every night I pray with my children my, my children went to bed at seven last night I didn't get home till 10 I, I left the church about 10 o'clock do you think I woke him up and said, hey, guys, wake up, it's time to pray. No, I didn't. I let him sleep. Would I, I'd be lying to you if I said I'd pray with my wife every night before we went to bed. Should I, should I pray more? Yeah. Do I think it's important? Yes. Do I think you should? Yes. Do I think I should? Yes. Nobody is perfect in the training process we should all be spending time praying with our families and, and reading Scripture with our families. 
One person said this, that God has designed the family as the first source of spiritual training and preparation for life. Spiritual inspiration and motivation and spiritual productivity for the cause of God. This is the training ground. This is where, where we make, uh, make the biggest impact on our kids' lives. It's where we can get them in and direct them and move them into a right relationship with God. Because if we don't do it, who's going to? Because the world isn't going to do it. This is a training ground. And the way we train our kids to have a right relationship with God begins by us having a right relationship with God. You cannot impart what you do not possess. If you don't know how to have a right relationship, good luck teaching someone else. Because a relationship isn't about a set of facts. It's not about, it's not about just information. A relationship goes much deeper than just information. And I've used this as an illustration. My brother-in-law is a big fan of Ronald Reagan. He is just, he loves Ronald Reagan. He could tell you all sorts of stuff about him, has all sorts of pictures on the wall, can tell you all sorts of facts about Ronald Reagan. But he has no relationship with Ronald Reagan. He knows a ton of information and has zero application. Has never shook his hand. We need to understand that families begin with a right relationship with God ourselves. Let's not miss that. So first of all, it deals with the right relationship. Secondly, within the context of the family, the family is a reward from God. Now let me just preface this. If you don't have, a, if you don't have children or you don't have a spouse, it doesn't mean that you're not rewarded from God. God has other ways he can reward us, by the way. But our children are a trophy. They are a trophy. Psalm 127.3 says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. One guy said that the psalmic portrayal also calls children a reward, not a curse, not a tragedy, not an accident. They are the expression of God's favor it is thrilling sight. It is a thrilling sight to see your children through the lens of Scripture as his trophies. People say, I don't have any trophies. You're like, well, you got a couple kids, don't you? God has rewarded you. He has given you something. Trophies in their children. Oftentimes I hear this that, oh, I've got my kids to think about. And they say it so pathetically it should be I have my kids that I have to think about it's not boy look at I have a I have a, a, a ball on my leg and I gotta drag my kids around everywhere I go you say these are my trophies from God this is this is my reward I don't I don't loathe taking my children to Israel I look forward to it my wife and I, we talk about this all the time. Well, on our, I, I, I promised her, I said, on our, on our first anniversary, I said, on our anniversary, I said, we're going to go to Hawaii. And Leo, this is for you. I wanted to go to Hawaii. And uh, never been there, by the way. Fifth anniversary comes around. I'm telling you, we're going to go to Hawaii. She said, I thought we are going to go to Hawaii on our fifth anniversary. I said, I never said that. <laughs> I said, on our anniversary, we're going to Hawaii. Tenth anniversary comes around. I thought we are going to Hawaii. <laughs> I never said that. I said, on our anniversary, we're going to Hawaii. I still haven't gone to Hawaii. I've been married a while now. 14 years. She thinks I do that for effect. I don't. I just don't remember. <laughs> True. We say to ourselves, well, would we bring our kids to Hawaii with us? Yes, we would. Is it wrong not to? No, I don't believe that. You can, you can not travel with your kids and it not be wrong. You can travel with your kids and not be wrong. Here's what I'm saying. My kids, when they turn 18 they may never go on another trip with us again. I got 18 years, 17 years. That's all I get. And I, I want to spend as much time with my reward, my trophies, 
as I can. I would love to take them on every, every place, every time I had to go on a trip somewhere, I was, was disappointed. The only thing I, I was like, man, I just can't wait to get back and be with my wife and my kids, and I just really want to spend time with them. I, I just hate being away. We would FaceTime when we were in, when we were in Israel. We FaceTime with them. It was fun. You know, praise God for FaceTime, right? Thank you, Steve Jobs. I don't know what we do without that. Skype. Who came up with Skype? Is that, a, is that a PC thing? Who knows? Your children are a heritage. You know what? They are an inheritance. That's what the word heritage means. I've never gotten an inheritance outside of my kids. I've never gotten an inheritance. Nobody ever said, I'm going to give you an inheritance of X amount of dollars. Never once. But I have my kids as an inheritance. It's what God gives me as a reward and again, this isn't to say that if you don't have kids, you don't have an inheritance. We have an inheritance that's, 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 uh, uh, that's incorruptible. It's reserved in heaven for us. That fadeth not away. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful inheritance in heaven. So number one, your kids are a trophy. And number two, your wife is a blessing. Now I could say some things about some husbands being a blessing, potentially. It's not found in the Bible. But <laughs> I could make something up. Here's the reality. Your wife is a blessing. Your wife is a blessing. Proverbs 18.22 says, whoso, fi whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor. That's a blessing, by the way, of the Lord. In the world, I have heard so, I, I, I have heard so many times people say, yeah, but i gotta, I got to deal with my wife. No different than the kids' statement. i got to go home to my wife. They, 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 they call their wife um, the old lady. Don't call your wife an old lady. Even if she's an old lady, you call her a young lady. Okay? I know that's lying, but still call her a young lady because she's young compared to some. So that's not really lying. Love your wife. Love your wife. Listen, you, have, you men who have a wife have, have a blessing from God. She, she's, she's not an accident. She's not uh, the ball and chain. She's your wife. And you should love her as your wife. I tell people, I say, my wife is my best friend. There's nobody in the world I would rather spend time with than my wife. Nobody. Not even my kids. I love my kids. I love spending time with them. I want to spend time with my wife more than anybody else. She is my best friend. I don't have any best friends except my wife. Where I go, she goes, generally speaking. Even throughout the day, it's nice to, nice to be here in this place and, uh, and, have your, and ha have your kids here and have your wife here. And, and sometimes they'll say, hey, honey, i got to make a quick run to the store real quick. And she says, okay, I'll go. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. This isn't a punishment. Your wife is not a, a punishment from God. It's a blessing. Ecclesiastes 9.9 9 says this, Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life, of thy vanity which he hath given thee under the sun. Live joyfully with your wife. How many times is there a, a conflict between a husband and a wife? And I say, that's a tragedy. We should live joyfully with our spouses. I don't think it's an accident that verse 10 follows verse 9, by the way. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. I don't think that's there by accident. Whatever you find to do, when you're loving your wife, you do it with all of your might. That's how we ought to love our wives. And, and wives, there's a, there is a message here for you too. We don't have time. But you need to love your husbands too, by the way. And this is, this is good for all of us. What we have is we have a reward from God. We have a blessing from God. And we need to honor God with our families. We need to honor God with our families. We don't live for our families. Our families should live for God. One person said this, a great way to put it. We do not live to glorify our families. Our families live to glorify God in this generation and each one to come. That is the purpose of our family. Our family within the context of a right relationship and understanding the right perspective that they are a reward from God, we ought to glorify God with our families. This should be preeminent in our thinking. You know, no one has a greater impact on your family than you do. No one has a greater impact on your family than you do. 
And no one has a greater influence on society than a God-honoring family does. You see the family... So, so the family goes, so goes the world. When you have a messed up society, look at the families. And you'll see them coming apart at the seams. Without a strong family, we have a weak world. When a family honors God, it's attractive to others. Do you know that? You know when a family honors God, when a, when a, when a husband and wife have a right relationship? And when, when the kids have a right relationship with their parents and parents with their kids, that's attractive to people. People look at that and they like that. Now you don't, you don't try to do that because it's attractive to other people. You do that because you, you have a right relationship with God. That is the byproduct. Is that people will look at you and say, and say wow, that is an amazing family. And I'll tell you this, I, this is truly what I believe. I believe that the one reason that the... That the uh, uh, that the Mormons have had such a, a tremendous influence on the world. And they have, by the way. The Mormons are just sweeping across America, and they're become, it's becoming normalized, the, the Mormon religion. And I'm not saying that the Mormons aren't nice people. I'm sure that they're nice people. I've met some Mormons, nice people. They have a wrong religion, but they're really nice people. But you know what? It looks so, it looks so attractive. It looks so attractive to see the husband and the wife and they're smiling and they've got the three kids in the suits and they're all smiling and they're all going to church together. And it looks so good to the world, doesn't it? And we say, wow, that, that's, that's what I want right there. And you know what? Because of that, they're able to influence people because they have what other people want. You are the strongest influence on your family, and your family is the strongest influence on the world. And that begins with a right relationship with God within the context of the family. When we are walking and talking with our Lord, when we are walking and talking with Him, when we have a right relationship with Him, with God, things work out. You know when things don't work out? When we're not walking and talking with God. When we don't have a right relationship with him, things fall apart. We lose perspective as they are our reward. We, we begin to look at them as a, as a problem, as an accident, as, oh, another thing I have to take care of. But when we have a right relationship with God, we can instill a right relationship with our children. We can impact their lives. We look at our children and our wife as a reward and as a blessing. And because of that, we impact society. Society is different because of families. It's just true. We need to understand this within the context of a right relationship with God and the right perspective that our kids are a reward from God. Let me say this too. Don't take this for granted. Don't take your families for granted. It's amazing how quickly we take things for granted. Then when we lose them, we wish we wouldn't have. We say, we say wow, what I would have done differently. How many of y'all would have said, I, I would have done things differently? Anybody? I, I, probably everybody. I, I mean, I look back, and, and in just, just my, my work, when, I, when the kids were little, they were um, er, littler, <laughs> right? He's ducking a little bit. He's, they were, when they were littler, smaller. Uh, I, I remember I worked like a, like a dog. I would, I would kiss him on the cheek before they'd get up in the morning and I'd come home and I'd kiss him on their cheek and they'd be sleeping. Very, very tough. If I had to do things differently, I would have said no to the job, said yes to my kids. Even something small like that, I would change. It would work less. Don't take your kids for granted. And in conclusion, let me just finally say this. Don't take your church family for granted. Don't take your church family for granted. Y'all are here right now, and we're all in the midst of friends. I mean, we're all sinners. None of you are perfect. I'm not perfect. My wife is pretty close, but she's not perfect. Now listen, don't take your church family for granted. You get, you, listen, we need to look beyond some of, our, some of the things. And in a family, as a family grows, you start to, you start to nitpick, don't you? Don't, just don't do that. And I don't see that in this church. And it's a caution.
to be careful, as families grow, to be careful and to look beyond some differences. We have an awesome church family. I thank God for I really thank God. Bill and I and, uh, and Howard were praying in the back room before church started, and we just, we just I was like, Lord, thank you for a, a really a unified church. We just thank God for that. Don't take it for granted. I'm glad you're all here. Listen, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you don't know where you're going when you die, when you die, listen, you, you really have one of two options. Either you're going to spend an eternity with God or you're going to spend an eternity without him. I would much rather spend an eternity with him. And friends, if you're here today and you can't say definitively, I know that I am going to spend an eternity with God, I want to share something with you because you can know for sure. You can absolutely know for sure. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that we all have sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. We're all sinners. The person next to you, your spouse is a sinner, so be gracious with them. Your kids are a sinner, so be gracious with them. Thank God for a wife. We have obtained favor. We found a good thing. We have a reward and inheritance as our children, but they're not perfect. They're not perfect and you're not perfect, and we all have this sin. And what the Bible says, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is not church membership. It's not giving money to the church. It's not getting baptized. It's not walking an aisle. It's not turning from all of your sin. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth. and He died. The wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. The Bible is clear. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. There's a lot of people that say, well, I'm just trying to live the best I can. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do good. Well, being good is good, but being good isn't good enough to get you to heaven. You ought to be perfect. And there's only one that was perfect, and that's Christ. And it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saves us. And the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not works. It's not turning over a new leaf or giving a new life or giving money or, or walking an aisle or raising a hand or praying a prayer. It's when you, in the quietness of your own mind, trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. That's how simple it is. It's not meant to be complicated. If it was complicated, we would, we would all mess it up. I thank God that the wages of sin were death, was death and that he died to take our place and that through simple faith alone in Jesus Christ alone we can have eternal life. Now get that, eternal life. Life that you can never lose. People say, well, if, what, what, but you can, be, you, can, you, can, uh, you can sin so bad you lose it. No, you can't because you didn't earn it to begin with. If you could sin so bad that you lose it, then you're saving yourself through good works. But good works don't save you. It's Jesus who saves you, not you that saves you. Praise God. And we're kept saved, the Bible says, by the power of God unto salvation. We're kept saved by the power of God. He saves us and keeps us saved. And he seals us, Ephesians chapter, chapter 1, he seals us by the Holy Spirit. You know how you know you're saved? Because Jesus Christ indwells your life. He, he indwells you. You are saved and sealed. He calls it the earnest. The earnest, that's where the earnest money. He gives us the down payment of the Holy Spirit in our life. He seals us forever. And we can never lose that. Well, you, can you give it away? No, you can't give it away. You didn't earn it. It was a gift given to you and you're sealed by God's Spirit. You can't give away something. We're kept by God's power. Not something we can give away. I love to use my kids as an example. And I always say this. I say, I say they could hate me. They could, they could say, Dad, I don't love you anymore. I, I don't care. I want to I wanna disown you. I want you to disown me. I don't want any part of your life. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that God seals us. And you know what? They are sealed. Because if you, take, if you draw their blood and you draw my blood, they'll say, hey, these two, he, he's part of his family. DNA. 
They, they are part of my family. They can never do anything to become my own family. Even, even the wickedest thing they do, they, was, they will always be my children. And I thank God for that. Because how many times in our lives do we sin? How many times in our lives do we mess up? You know what? The Bible says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. It doesn't say he'll never leave us nor forsake us as long as we have good behavior. God knew that we were going to sin, and he dies on the cross to pay for it. And by simple faith alone in Jesus alone, we have eternal life. It's wonderful. And we are born into his family, John chapter 3. John chapter 1 says, To as many as receive him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. We become a child of God by simple faith alone in Christ alone. Now that, my friends, is a miracle. You can all partake of this wonderful miracle by trusting Christ. If you haven't done that, I ask that you do that. I ask that you trust Christ as your Savior.